Stock Play of the Day is an educational program. Any statements made by Ally Invest employees are not intended to be or should be considered investment advice, a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold a security, or a recommendation to adopt an investment strategy. Welcome to the Stock Play of the Day. Today's stock is going to be D, uh, DR Horton, symbol is DHI. We'll discuss should we pass or should we play? Hello, my name is Brian Overby. I am the Senior Options Analyst with Ally Invest. And I'm Lindsay Bell, Chief Investment Strategist with Ally Invest. All right, Lindsay. Well, we have a chart of the S&P 500 index up. It's a three-month chart that we're showing. And we've definitely set a new high in the SPX over the last couple of weeks. Uh, besides Apple splitting and Tesla splitting, what else is going on this week? Yeah, those are two big uh, headliners today. And both of those stocks, by the way, are uh, up pretty substantially in, in, the, in the market this morning. Just a reminder to our viewers, when a stock splits, it doesn't really change things too much fundamentally for a company. Um, so just a reminder on that point. But looking at the broader overall market, the s and about flat. The Dow's down, the NASDAQ's up today. Um, so a little bit of a mixed bag. The S&P 500 has had this impressive run all summer long, um, which is really uncharacteristic for the t this index. Um, but August especially has been extremely popular. Through Friday's close, we saw the S&P 500 up 7.2%. That could make it the best August on record since uh, 1984. Uh, so it's a pretty, pretty great stat. But today, uh, you know, stalling out maybe a little bit here. Um, after a really strong week, fueled partially by the Fed statement saying that, hey, look, we're listen, we're, we're ready to keep interest rates low for longer, really going to focus on that inflation number. We want to see inflation really improve before we start uh, pushing interest rates higher, which obviously is a really good thing um, for, for the stock market. It helps boost risk assets like um, the S&P 500. Um, so we saw a continuation of that last week, this morning. Um, like I said, it's, it's the last trading day of August. So investors are starting to think about uh, what they want to do in the month of September, which, by the way, is usually the weakest month of the year for the index. It's only up, um, up less than 50 percent of the time. Uh, so investors have a lot to think about moving forward this week specifically. We're going to be getting, getting that uh, August jobs report on Friday. We saw an improvement in July. Did that continue through to August? Did the unemployment rate continue to come down? We'd like to get see it come under that 9.9% rate that we saw at, at the peak of the great financial crisis. We want to see things are continuing uh, to improve. So investors might, might be in a wait and see mode until we get that uh, information. But yeah, so there's a lot of things to think about going into the week. Uh, one thing though, like I mentioned already, Brian, though, is, is that the NASDAQ is in the green today. Wow. The Dow's down. By the way, the Dow is shuffling some names. Uh, Exxon Mobil and Pfizer and Raytheon Technology are getting kicked out. And uh, Salesforce, Amgen, and Honeywell are the ones uh, being ushered in to take their places. All this uh, is in response to Apple's stock split because the Dow is a price-weighted index. So when Apple cuts its price, it becomes a much smaller component of the index. Uh, and the Dow ind indices folks have to uh, rejigger and adjust it. They do that on a regular basis, too. Um, but anyway, so sorry to get sidetracked there, but the NASDAQ flying higher again today. Um, you, it's, it's not unusual, I guess, in the last summer months to see that, that the NASDAQ carries the market on the days where the other bigger indices like the Dow and the S&P 500 are a little bit weaker. Um, but the question I think investors have been asking themselves for the last couple months is, can this uh, wave of strength from the NASDAQ continue forever? Brian, what do you think? All right. Well, if I look, we, we see the new high in the SPX over the last three months. And it's basically once it broke through this level, which I'm kind of highlighting here, which is about 3,400. Now we just will continue to go 
uh, straight up, basically back to the parabolic move to the upside. So I want to take some time and actually look at, since we are at the end of the month, like you mentioned, uh, let's look at the monthly chart in the SPX. I always like to do that and see what type of candles that we have uh, over the month's worth of trading. So if I change up my interval here, let's look at a one month chart and we're gonna zoom in a little bit on the chart here. We see that since the, the lows in March, basically in the SPX, we have three, one, two, three, four, five very big green candles basically showing the move in the SPX. A lot of times, we obviously know that the markets are up, but a lot of times when you show it this way, you see how the market just hasn't stopped uh, since the big downturn in March. And the NASDAQ is even more parabolic when you look at it. The candles are bigger and uh, the tops are heavier, if you will. Um, so once again, March, April, May, June, August, uh, three, one, two, three, four, five really big green candles in the NASDAQ. And something happened today uh, around 11 o'clock Eastern time. We actually finally saw a little bit of bearishness in the marketplace. One of the big things that is also a, a nervousness sign here is that we still have the VIX index. It's actually gone up when we have this big green candle in August on the monthly chart basis. Um, and we also have that in the SPX, two very big green candles. And with that, usually you see some of the nervousness come out of the marketplace. You usually see the VIX index, which was trading at around 22% at the beginning of the month, is now up over 25% today. So we've even seen, in spite of the big moves to the upside, which usually removes some of the nervousness in the marketplace, we're still seeing the VIX in index increase, which is basically tracking the volatility in the S&P 500 index. It's based off of the options that trade in the S&P 500 index. So very odd to see the VIX going up when we have such strong markets. But with that said, if we go and look at uh, some volume today, some interesting volume that I just noticed inside our option chains, this is in the QQQs, and this is going all the way out to the March expiration, about 200 days away, which I'm highlighting here on, the, on my screen. Uh, right now, the VIX or the QQQs, the um, ETF that tracks the NASDAQ, is trading at 294.87. We're up about $2.34, or just under 1%. But here's the volume that I'd like to highlight as we see. There's not a lot of open interest in these put options going out to March, but we saw one big trade on the 255 strike, uh, $255 strike put option, and you see the 40,000, over 40,000 contracts traded today. Now, the one thing that makes it interesting is that there was no open interest. So uh, we saw that that market, that by looking at the tape, you can actually see that that came in as a buy. And there is no open interest. So it was probably a buy to open. Now, what does that mean about the markets overall? Well, we don't know exactly what was in the trader's head, but that's a fairly expensive trade saying that it would like the QQQs to be below 255 by that March expiration date. So in general, you can take, take from that what, whatever you would like, but that's a lot of money going into some puts in the QQQ. All right. So with that said, we have the parabolic trading and, and uh, going into the end of August uh, in the NASDAQ and also in the SPX. But let's talk about home builders today. Our stock today, E.R. Horton, symbol DHI. Let me get a chart up for you, Lindsay. And let's talk a little bit about what's happening in the home builders. Yeah, let's do it. Um, before I dig in, though, just a reminder to our viewers that we do take your questions at the end of the show. So there's that chat box on the right hand side of the video. Feel free to write us any questions you have and we will get to them at the end of the show as many as we can. Uh, we appreciate your participation in the show. All right, we've got a chart here of DR Horton. We're going to talk a little bit about the home builders. Uh, we don't have a chart of the XHB, but up, but it looks Kind of similar. It's, it's, it's done pretty well this year. It's been up 17% on a year-to-date basis. That compares the S&P 500, which by the way is up 8.6% on a year-to-date basis. So pretty darn good year so far for the index, far from over. Um, 
but that's where we're at um, and how the home builders have done and how, how they've outperformed versus the big index. So now D.H. Horton has been one of the outstanding, I guess, or I don't know if I want to use the word outstanding. It's uh, outshine some of the other home builders. Um, and it is up about 36% on a year-to-date basis here. So you can see that it's just, it's really had a great run. Home builders in general really benefiting from this um, change in demographic trends as the millennials come of age. Um, obviously, home builders have been fueled by lower interest rates, increasing home prices. And the pandemic really kicked things into high gear as people that lived in, um, in these major metropolitan areas they're now seeking to get out and get into uh, so a more suburban, a more suburban life. I know I did that, Brian. I was in New York City uh, before I moved to the sh- suburbs of Charlotte in early July. It's been great so far, um, but the trends in general for home building have been really, really solid. Um, some of the economic data over the last several months too really supports the trend that you're seeing in these stocks in that new home prices or new home sales, excuse me, jumped to a 14 year high in July, uh, home builder sentiment. So these guys that we're talking to, they're building the homes, they are, are very feeling very optimistic. This, this indicator, the home builder sentiment indicator is at the highest level since 1998. So you have to go back even past the last boom to get to those levels. And that's because home ownership is on the rise, 67.9% of the U.S. population now owns a home as of the end of the second quarter of 2020. And that was a huge spike up, led uh, primarily from those under the age of 35. Uh, home ownership for, for those 35 and under spiked to about 41% in the second quarter, the highest jump that we've seen in a really long time. And there were questions after the great financial crisis if home ownership was even going to return because people had you know, the the speculation was the people's um, thinking around home ownership had been completely flipped on its head after that experience. Um, But what we're seeing today is that that is not the case. Home ownership is is definitely um, something that is on the rise. Even existing home sales, which doesn't really impact the the home builders as much, uh, is seeing a huge jump as well. And that that's surprising because their inventory is super low. There's not a lot of people in existing homes that are, are willing to leave. Um, so when, 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 when inventories are low and existing home sales are still doing really well, that's a positive sign for the housing market too. So these home builders just really on a tear, I would point to the right-hand side of this chart. You see several red bars here at the very end. Um, and so, so D.H. Horton, it's down about 7% since August 21st. And you'll see very similar trends in, in the XHB, which is the Home Builder Index, and um, some of the other home builders in general, too. And I think that was, you know, after we got the latest new home sales, people started questioning, hey, we're getting into the fall selling season. We're getting into the winter where numbers typically slow down, less people are buying homes because of the colder weather. Um, There's a seasonality to the home builders um, and home building uh, in general. And so people are thinking, hey, we got July numbers. Maybe August will probably be pretty good, but these stocks have been on a tear. And it's possible that things start slowing down into the winter months. Um, So I think that's what you're seeing reflected in some of these stocks. Um, But some of the industry analysts that follow the home builders still remain extremely optimistic given that backdrop that I gave to you at the beginning of my spiel here, low interest rates, uh, millennials coming of age, the pandemic drawing people to the suburbs, that stuff all still remains intact. And oh, by the way, the baby boomers are in there too. And they're, they're um, shopping for new homes, new, bigger, better, more luxurious homes as well. So uh, there's a lot uh, to, to work with here within the group. We're picking D.H. Horton here to just look at as a paper trade. Brian's going to get into more the why there. But I would also just want to just want to point out some of the other home builder stocks. Meritage Home, um, they're like a mid-sized builder that, that caters to first-time home buyers. Unlike D.H. Horton, which is the largest home builder in the country, um, these guys are a little bit smaller. Um, like I said, looking for those entry players. But then there's also a Toll Brothers and you have... 
um, another company called Taylor Morrison. They and they cater to the more luxury end or move up markets too, which have also done really well. So there's a lot of different companies that you can look at in this space when you're looking for different options trades. Um, but of course, you have to keep the liquidity in mind and, and the spreads. And Brian's going to go over that here when he gets into the trade. So. So that's my quick overview. I know I didn't do as much of a deep dive in DH Horton as I normally do on the individual stocks here, but in general, we wanted to start looking at the home builders um, given the run they have and the expectation by many industry analysts that that run can potentially continue into next year. So Brian, talk to me about the trade, DH Horton, maybe start with why you picked this one out of all those other options. All right, we can do that. Uh, so today we're going to look at a short put spread, and I'll come back to this. This is the Ally Invest Options Playbook. We're going to look at a short put spread, very similar to the type of trade that we looked at last week, mainly because we have a down stock right now. As Lindsay pointed out, there were a lot of red bars recently, down 7% since the uh, reaching an all-time high. So with that said, when we look at the option chains, uh, I have DHI up right now, and that's the stock that we're going to look at. But I always want to pay attention to the liquidity of the underlyings. A lot of these home builders, even though they are very popular as stocks, they don't have a lot of volume in their option trading. So if I scroll down and I look at uh, the expiration that we're going to look at today is about 32 days out. This is a weekly expiration. It's not the normal monthly expiration overall. So that means that they just haven't lived as long as the normal monthly expiration would. But if we look at the most at the money option contract, we see a, a fairly tight market. Uh, at the 72 strike call is trading 315 by 335. On the put side, we're 340 by 365. And you always want to be uh, cognizant of the width of these bid ask spreads because if you're buying and selling option contracts, you always have to deal with that. And that's a true cost to trading options. And so if we look at uh, MTH, which is Meritage uh, Home Corporation, if we look at, at those option contracts and we'll go out to the same expiration, oh, actually they only have monthly expirations in, in, in MTH. And if I scroll out to that and we'll look at that October 16th expiration date, we see that the most at the money option contract here is about a dollar wide. Uh, we're seeing that 97.50 trading by 550 by 650. So we have a similar price stock. We have a little bit more expensive option contracts. But what concerns me more about maybe trading this underlying, even if I was more uh, interested or more bullish on it, if I'm going to be trading option contracts, I always want to lean to the option contracts that have more liquidity, tighter bid ask spreads overall. So that's the point that we were kind of that Lindsay was inferring uh, about. Now let's get back and let's look at the trade. So what we're going to do is look at a short put spread today, saying that we are neutral to bullish on this underlying. Now we're going to go a little bit out of the money. It's going to give us a little bit of leeway, uh, just like we did last week in our underlying stock. We looked at selling an out of the money put spread with the intention that, well, gosh, if it comes down, I might even actually want to buy the stock. Because when I sell a put, I'm saying I will take on the obligation to buy that underlying stock at the strike price that we selected by wow. that expiration date. We're going to go out about 30 some days. So uh, here's the short put spread once again in the Ally Invest Options Playbook. If you want to check it out, read a little bit more about it. But let's get into the chain and look at the trade that, that we have in this underlying today. So Symbol is going to be DHI, oops, DHI. And right now we're just down about 13 cents on it. We're gonna look at selling the 68 strike put, going out to that expiration. Let's change this up. We're gonna go out 32 days. And there we go. Okay, so we're gonna sell the 68 strike put. Stock is at 71.65, and then we're gonna buy the 65 strike put. Okay, so by selling the 68 strike put with 32 days remaining, we're saying that if the stock comes down to 68, you can put 100 shares to us at that strike price. 
For that, for saying that, we could bring in somewhere between $1.75 and $2, uh, just saying that we'd be willing to buy that 100 shares at that strike. Now, that's a good amount of money relative uh, to, to the strike price that we're selling and how far we are out of the money. But as I mentioned uh, when we were talking about the indexes, volatilities are high. They're high not only in the indexes, they're also high in the underlying stocks. We see this is trading at about a 40% implied volatility, which if you think of the S&P 500 index, that's trading at about, on a 30-day basis, it's trading at about a 25% implied volatility. So we're getting some premium here. So I'm going to take some of that premium and I'm going to protect myself. How do I do that? Well, we spread it off. And this is the, the definition of a short put spread. So we're going to go further out of the money and we'll buy some protection. We're going to buy that 65 strike put. So net net, we're going to spend some money to protect ourselves on the downside. Even if we're willing to buy the underlying at the 68 strike, in this marketplace, it, it makes sense to me to use some of that cash to protect yourself on the downside for the short term, okay? So in this instance, we're three points wide on our spread. That's gonna be our maximum risk. That would be $300 for every one by one short put spread that we did. Now, the maximum upside is gonna be wherever, whatever we can get filled at. So on our paper trade this week, and once again, not meant to be a recommendation, we're just trying to learn here on the stock play of the day. Uh, right now, we're showing the midpoint at about 67 cents. So I'm going to put this in the right rail, and we'll make this the official paper trade for the week. Uh, and we'll put the midpoint in right about here, about 67 cents. Now, a midpoint fill is never guaranteed. Uh, it's uh, whenever we're looking at it, one thing about spread trading is a lot of times you can work the trade a little bit more because you're giving the marketplace a buy and a sell. So we'd hope to fill somewhere near that midpoint. We'll call it 67 cents. That means for every one by one spread uh, where we have $300 worth of risk overall, that's the maximum that this, that this spread could trade for. We're going to bring in about 67 cents or $67. And don't forget to subtract commissions from that trade. Commissions are always important. All right. So now if we do this underlying, if we do this trade, and I'll leave that there for just a second. Now let me close it out. Let's run down and look at the profit and loss graph. And we'll zoom in here on it. Okay, so the gray bar is showing where the underlying stock is at. Here's the buffer that we have from basically 71 and a half approximately where the stock is at down to 68. We're still in the, in the good zone, right, for this trade. So from 68 on down, then the risk kicks in. But then it stops from 65 on down, we would be down on the trade, but we have limited and known downside because we bought that protective put. Now the colored line here shows us, here's our profit and loss as of today. And we talked a lot about this on last week's stock play of the day overtime edition. If you put this trade on going out further in time, we're going out about 30 days as opposed to doing the weeklies, gives you a little bit of a buffer in that if the market goes against you, it doesn't go against you quite as hard. And we see here that if tomorrow that underlying stock went down to 65, we would be down a lot less than if it did it closer to the expiration date. But now the opposite is also true. On the upside, if we are correct on our forecast, the stock needs to move quite a bit before we start getting to that uh, dotted line, which is the expiration graph. So, when I'm trading these underlyings and we're not doing it around earnings, we're not, we're avoiding those specific events. And we're looking at this trade as, a, a, as I would like to bring in a net credit and get as much of that credit as possible. If I'm approaching it that way, I don't mind erring by going out a little bit further in time. Now I can take the approach that in two weeks time, I'm going to close this trade, just like if I did a, a shorter term weekly contract, I can take that approach. But if you go out further in time, it allows you to adjust the trade if you would like, or it allows you a, a little bit of a buffer if your forecast is incorrect and it goes against you. So now let's change it up and let's go all the way down to like uh, three days remaining to expiration. I'm gonna uh, do that by changing the days to go in this little box right here. And then we'll re-graph it. 
And you see now that colored line is looking a lot more like the dotted line over time. But so we're, we're saying we just erased about 27 days. Now this is all in theory. And let's go down to zero days remaining to expiration. And now the graph basically morphs the expiration graph. So if I'm trading the short put spread, I can have two different views on it. Uh, and I'll put the trade right back up. It's trading at 69 cents at the midpoint now. I can have the view that Yes, I would like to use this to buy the underlying stock. And if I have the money in my account to buy this stock at 68, that means I need $6,800 to be able to buy 100 shares at that 68 put, uh, at that uh, short put strike of 68. Well, I can do that. I can take that approach and say, if it goes down a little bit more, I wouldn't mind buying some of the shares of the stock. Now, if I take the approach that I really don't want to buy the stock, I'm going to close this out if it goes against me hard. A lot of times if I'm bringing in uh, 60, we said 67 cents when we were looking at the paper trade in the right rail. Um, if it doubles that, in other words, if I'm down 67 cents on that position, let's say it's trading for uh, $1.20, $1.30, somewhere in that range, I'm going to cl just close out the trade and I'm going to move on. But I'll have that small pill to land on because we went out further in time gave us time to adjust the trade if we wanted to, or close out the trade if it goes hard against us to the downside. All right, so that's the scenario on the paper trade for this week, Lindsay. Uh, let's get back and look at some listener questions. Uh, do we have any questions out there? Oh yeah, we do. Uh, we got a pretty active crowd again today, which is really great. Um, since you're talking about the, the pricing and how the trade could turn out, I'll start with a Amit. 111978 asks, what will happen if the price ends up between 65 and 68 at expiration? All right. Well, I think I'm going to keep my, my uh, graph up here. This is the profit and loss graph. Um, if we start, it, it, it really depends on where it's at as expiration approaches. So this is as of today, 31 days to go. This is the profit and loss graph right now. If we finish somewhere in between, first of all, you're gonna have a decision to make um, because it's not gonna be made for you. Do I close out the trade? Do I still wanna buy that underlying stock? But the, the price and the effect of, to the pricing of the option contracts will matter a lot as expiration approaches, if, especially if we're in between the strikes, the short strike and the long strike. And I kind of demonstrated that at the end of my analysis by looking at it. But obviously you can do this using the profit and loss calculator. It's all done in theory. You know, we're assuming that implied volatilities and everything stay the same. But if I, let's go and just cut it in half. We'll go from uh, 30 days down to 15 days. And you see not that much changes. Where do we see that bulk of the change? Well, let's go all the way down to seven days remaining to expiration. Now the graph turns a little bit. And then we go down to one day remaining to expiration. And now we see that big switch in how the, the actual strategy reacts between the strikes as expiration approaches. So now it is important that at expiration, if it's between your strikes, that you do make a decision there because you, you could end up buying that underlying stock and thinking that your put would be assigned the long put. But if that doesn't happen because you're in between the strikes, you're gonna have to make a decision or you just wanna close out that trade before that actual expiration date. All right, anything more on the options field, Lindsay? Yeah, so we got a couple questions. First, Hitman asks, and I'll probably take a crack at this answer, are general REITs a good investment if we anticipate home builders are gonna go higher? Um, I think the answer to that really is when you think about general REITs, REITs can invest in a lot of different types of properties. Um, you have to look for residential REITs if you want to get exposure to the home builder or housing market. And even those, you have to get into the weeds and make sure you know what you're investing in or the, 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 what the REITs are actually investing in, because some of them invest in apartment buildings. And with, with people moving to homes, apartment buildings have been having higher levels of vacancy, so lower level of rental income, which can negatively impact uh, the performance of those types of REITs. Some of the other residential REITs invest in student housing, uh, and, and, but there are some that do invest in single homes. 
Uh, so you just have to kind of dig around to find one that, that invests in what you like. Uh, a lot of the other REITs um, invest in commercial spaces, like there's data centers, there's uh, shopping malls, there's a whole slew of different types of REITs. Just, so just know what you're getting into um, if you're going to go that route in particular. Um, it might be a little easier if you want direct exposure to home builders to look at look at the individual securities or even an uh, index, um, an equity index of those. I don't know, if Brian, you have anything else to add? Uh, not too much, except for option trading just basically doesn't exist in REITs overall. Uh, the liquidity factor is pretty big. Um, so don't really think about REITs and trading options on them. I'm sure there's a few exceptions to that, but that's usually the norm. Good to know, good to know. And then Brian, uh, several other uh, folks in the chat have have asked about paper trading. Uh, obviously at Ally, you can't just go in and put this trade in and kind of watch it without putting, putting money behind it. Um, yeah. We obviously offer the option playbook that you shared earlier um, to help educate newer investors about options trading. Uh, but is there anywhere else you would recommend these folks go or check out to kind of start trading in a, you know, in a simulated way. Well, put real money to work. Yeah, that there are a few, um, there are a few paper trading apps out there. It's hard to find a good option paper, paper trading app. And I don't have one right off the top of my head where I could send you to try to do the option paper trading. But the biggest thing is to just follow these trades and look at how they are pricing out as time goes by. Because I think the biggest thing about learning options, if you're new to it, is understanding that an option is priced much differently than the stock because of that time decay. And the best thing that you can do to try to have realistic expectations is to use an options pricing calculator or something like our profit and loss calculator that shows you as expiration approaches, how this underlying, uh, how these options might react. And then also realize that that's on a theoretical basis overall, but it gives you a realistic expectation in general about, um, about how the prices of the options may react to different conditions in the marketplace. So I, I don't have a great site to reference you to, but I think it's very important. And I wanna emphasize that these are meant to be paper trades until you, feel comfortable with the trades. You don't want to put capital behind them. All right. Well, Brian, we are at time. But on that note, I would just add the great thing about the Stock Play of the Day show is that Brian reviews this exact trade on Fridays at noon in the Stock Play of the Day overtime. So you can follow along with him to see how the trade is playing out without actually placing a real trade. So check in on Friday, same place right here on the Ally YouTube channel. Uh, Brian will be doing the stock play of the over stock play of the day overtime. This trade on DHI on Friday, he'll be checking in uh, on where where it stands. Right at noon Eastern time. And this Monday we have a holiday, so unfortunately we won't have a stock play of the day uh, coming up next week. But as Lindsay said, check out our stock play of the day overtime on Friday at wow. noon Eastern time. And if you'd like, why don't you just click subscribe and ring the bell to make sure you get all the alerts so you don't miss any stock play of the day events. Thanks for coming, everyone. And we'll talk to you in two weeks time.